Welcome into debate night, everybody. I'm back as your host again, um, running on minimal sleep, but I think it'll, it'll be all right. You know, I'm, I'm starting to adapt at this point. Uh, we've got an interesting show today, kind of a bunch of different topics. You know, we kind of had an off week there in the season after it kicked off. So we're kind of sorting through. We have a uh, some user generated, some audience generated topics, and then just some kind of other ones that have popped up here and there. Uh, and we also have some new analysts today. So let's get into the cast for today's show. Uh, firstly, we've got Brody Smith. Yeah, it looks like Rich is uh, new here, and his backdrop is on a hole that doesn't exist anymore for Waco, so slightly awkward. <laughs> um, okay, well, we are, we are joined as well by Rich. Rich, is, uh, do you have anything to say about that? I was just I was just there last week, and this hole was there. They took it off the... I, I threw my disc in the water, bro. You need to find my rock. Hopefully, at 18, least 18 is still there. The hole that like people slam people in the back hole 15, oh, that okay. weird par three, that's no longer there. They now have a new hole in between 16 and 17 on the water. Well, that's yeah. but, lots more opportunities yeah. to lose discs. Yeah, I like for it. For sure. <laughs> yeah. well, thanks, thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I've been playing since the late 90s to age myself. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, joined the PGA in like 07. And I'm an esports caster, and I have a YouTube channel where called Hold My Bag, where we do fantasy disc golf betting. My buddy and I. So, nice. That's, that's yeah, very fun. Out. All right. Uh, Hunter is here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I wasn't warned beforehand that we we're going to have another esports caster on. You know, this might <laughs> yeah. be tonight. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just stoked to have just three other guys who love the sport of disc golf, love competing, love getting <laughs> tournaments every weekend here with me. I'm, I'm stoked just to be a part of it. <laughs> um, and then we're also joined um, by a collegiate disc golfer, uh, high caliber collegiate disc golfer. Kate is here today. How's it going, everybody? Happy to be on the show. Um, yeah, like Hunt Trevor said play disc golf for Emporia State University. I've been playing professional on like the local scene. This will be my fourth season doing. And most people who recognize me probably recognize me from jumping in a frozen lake. So it was hey, a pretty do you good have clip. a big check behind you? Like one of those like uh happy Gilmore checks they give you out? No, it's like a I'm at the campus right now and it's oh, just like okay. sponsors that donated <laughs> to the it looked, I thought it was Betty one Hall. of those <laughs> big <laughs> checks that they give you out. Surprise money. That would have been sick. Yeah. Emporia State, I feel like they're like the Alabama Crimson Tide of, of college disc golf these days. Stingers up. Stingers up. Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to get into our first topic. Um, this one came, this was an audience-generated topic. So if you don't know, um, at the end of the show, we'll kind of throw a QR code up on the screen, but there's also a link in the description where you can generate any topic you want to see debated on the show. If it's something I think would be interesting to hear the guys talk about, we will throw it on there. So this one uh, came from that uh suggestion so uh this is a kind of an interesting one so the question here is why do you believe the pro tour is slowly abandoning short holes i kind of kind of said 350 feet and under but those really shorter holes uh when choosing layouts and new courses it seems like it seems that 85 percent of the shots are thrown at full power in the modern game does disc golf have a limitation to which holes that are short can only be so difficult before having to rely on gimmicks or should the tour mix in more holes that are short and technical what do you think the balance is there i think this one um, a lot of people would argue um, that those gimmicks are are necessary once a hole gets so short, but I don't know. There there could be an argument either way. So, Brody, what do you think about this? I mean, I think there are some short holes on tour. We're about to play a couple of them. Waco's got a couple. The Beast has a couple short par threes. Lake Waco does not. I want to say the shortest par three at Lake Waco might be around 350. Uh, it plays a little bit uphill as well. Um, but I think the answer to the question of like, why are we seeing less and less is because we are just slowly transitioning out of an era that most courses were designed for, uh, you know, the slower discs, the baskets also we're seeing that well, we almost don't even play on those baskets anymore, but the game was designed around a much slower disc. People weren't throwing nearly as far. The average distance on tour is going way, way up. And for you to actually get score separation, we can't have those super short holes anymore. You, it's very difficult to make a hole under 300 feet without it being gimmicky, I guess, or an island green where there actually is score separation. You throw a terrible shot, you're 100 feet away. People are jump putting, tapping in, getting a par. So there's only you know birdies and pars. Um, I think we're also going to 
locations and spots where we can get a little bit more aggressive with the land we have. And then the last thing I would say is, honestly, I think we're just doing away with a lot of par threes. We're getting more par fours, we're getting more par fives, and those short technical shots, we're seeing those more on the second shots of par fours, which I actually like a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah, I mean, definitely some good points there. I think that um, you're right, the game has evolved, certainly. I think that's a trend in uh, in traditional golf as well, uh, and with the lengthening of courses, but there are definitely some that speak out against that. Rich, do you agree with Brody? I mean, look, the, the point about disc speed is actually a phenomenal point that Brody made, and I think it's very smart that the game is getting longer, but I think this answer comes down to the answer to every decision that you're going to see any sports league make, and it comes down to one thing. That's money. Wooded courses are what you need for short holes. You need those. You can't have a short hole where there's no trees in it. And wooded courses are bad for selling tickets and having spectators, and they make it harder on production. You're spending more money when you're playing on shorter wooded, wooded holes. I, I, I think it's bad for the game. I think that the game has to, at least in some ways, reflect the game that the viewers are playing. There has to be a connection between what you guys are out there doing on the course in the Pro Tour and what the guy who's playing at the local 5,000, 6,000 foot course gets to do on his time as well. He has to feel that that's the same. Now, does that mean we shouldn't have 600, 800 foot, 900 foot holes out there? No, of course, we should have some of those. And that's why I think Waco is a great course. You have half the course that's out and open. We see some bombs and you have half the course that requires players to hit good lines. I think that a, a, a par three is gimmicky when either it's an auto, almost an automatic birdie, right? When you start to get below or above a 50% birdie rate, when the average is 2.3 strokes per hole, something like that. Or when you start to get too too funky some of the stuff at northwood black maybe where it's glitchy and there's not really a clear line or the lines are lines upon line you know it's almost kind of layered like this so i think that there needs to be some short par threes that require a clean release a clean approach and as long as you're keeping that birdie rate below 50 percent like 2.5 really i think 2.7 2.8 per hole is maybe a sweet spot you have a game that reflects the game that players at home are playing that helps them relate to the pro event and keeps us engaged. Yeah, no, I think that's actually a really good point because you're right. Th at times, it seems like there there is courses being played that are very different to what you might find in your local uh, selection, and you do have to keep the game like somewhat relatable, or else you're gonna be you're gonna have your spectators watching and just like you know they want to feel inspired to go play at their local course. That's Watch kind of FBO. the idea. All right, and we move on, <laughs> and we move on to Hunter now. Hunter, do you think uh, short holes have any place, or is the the writing kind of on the wall? Uh, I'm not gonna say they don't have any place, but I mean, first off, I think this question's based a lot on like the scorability of holes, which doesn't necessarily have to do with the distance. I mean, a wide open 350 foot hole on flat ground is a must birdie for pros on tour right now. I would also argue that maybe 10 to 15% of shots are actually being thrown, if even that at full power, instead of the 85% that this question posed. Uh, I think what happens is like at home, it's easy to hear 400 foot something par three and picture ourselves on that tee and what it would take for us to get there and completely forget that the best players in the world, 400 feet is just a lot different for them than it is for us. Um, but realistically, I think these decisions come down to three things, entertainment, filming, and spectators. So to make a 250 foot hole difficult enough for it to be worthy of being on tour, it either has to be extremely tightly wooded as Rich was saying, um, which then makes it hard to film and nearly impossible to get spectators in person, or it would have to be OB ridden, which again, makes it hard to understand when you're viewing at home or in person, what the heck's going on when a disc lands where. Extending that out to 350 feet plus provides most players with still a birdie opportunity, but it also allows it to film easier in most cases, and it provides more scoring separation, which I think is key here because scramble shots might still have 200 feet to go if a mistake happens, so fours come into play a lot more, and it provides 100 feet more of spectator access to the hole, which makes it easier to watch in person. So I wouldn't say there's no place for short holes on tour, but I don't think it should be a staple in the game and something we see at every tour course we go to. Okay. Yeah. And that is a, it's a fair point talking about the, the full power comment. I think that was more so meant to be like, um, not full power, but a lot of shots are thrown hard on tour off the tee. You see a lot of shots that are thrown well, hard. Well, it said full power. No, I, took, I took what was no, you're That's right. also what you're most right. players like to throw. I know. I totally agree. I'm, I, when I wrote the question, I'm more so thinking like you don't, 
you very rarely see a hole where a guy th steps up and throws a very finesseful kind of chippy shot off the tee. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was trying to write in as like, does, does a hole like that um, even have a place on tour? Um, but fair assessment there. All right, Cade, everybody so far kind of, kind of um, backing the short hole into a corner here. A lot of opposition to it. Do you agree with everything or do you have um, some uh, points against that? Yeah. So I agree with mostly everything that's been said. I think that firstly, I would like to, just to sing, distinguish that there's a difference between gimmicky and fair. And I think that when you see gimmicky, you see a hole with a gap in the woods where you have an initial gap, but then you have a tiny little tree way down the fairway that's just in the middle of the fairway. And I think that's what brings in the gimmickiness of short holes and why a lot of people don't like them. And I'm fine with short holes if they're really hard and there's a gap. And if you hit the line, you're going to be rewarded. That's perfectly fine with me. But what I'm not fine with is having a tiny little tree in the middle of the fairway that you could throw a good drive and get kicked off that. And then I would also like to transition into how a sub 350 foot hole can be used on tour without woods being involved. And I think the first way that you can use that is in an open course, you have say two trees out in the middle of the fairway. You put your tee pad and basket in a position to where you can add mandos on those two trees and even multiple sets of mandos to where it might not be the easiest thing to film. And that could be a problem, but it's definitely an idea that the tour should be looking at is to implement more mandos to allow for some shorter holes. But I definitely don't think that um, every course should have multiple of these one to two max. And I think the last thing that um, comes to mind is short Island shots like hole eight at Maple Hill or hole 16 at country Cl country club now champions landing, put those later in the round and that can provide, you know, a must birdie and a sh shot that should be really easy. Yeah. Uh, good Rebuttal. points. Birdie, what do you have? I would just say like the most famous hole, hole 17 USDGC, that hole plays 250 feet. Uh, the woods aren't really a factor. It's a pretty much an open shot, whether it's a backhand or a forehand, but it's designed in a way with the OB stroke and distance. The hay bales, I think, is also a huge thing of like building up the green around yeah. it. There's a way to make short holes. Now, should we have four of those on a course? Absolutely not. But I think you can still have that touchy shot because I'm with you, Trevor. The majority of people on tour want to throw 100%. So if that is like disking all the way down to a putter so they can throw it hard, the yeah. reason why that hole is so hard is you cannot throw a hard shot. Right. You have to throw something touchy late in the round. I love that. The pressure on, so good. Isn't yeah. that good that they have to be able to, to take touch on and not be able to throw? Like just put, you know, put yeah. some, yeah, I think it's good. It stretches your game out. Yeah, yeah, it's great for one hole. I think yeah, I on think an it, entire course. I think it. I think it's just yeah, it's challenging because you like you said like hole seventeen at USDGC. The, one of the things it does best is it creates like a visual OB and with the, the water behind and the hay bales and that is one of the challenges. And like to to Cade's points with the gap, um, I it, it's a weird line always talking about when you talk about the gimmick. Um, and he's right. You know, if, if there's a gap that if you hit the gap is fair and if you hit it and you're rewarded, then that can't really be described as a gimmick, but it's like, how small does a gap get before it's like almost a little bit silly? Like what can the disc golfer be expected to do? That's actually skill and not just luck because the gap is so small. I think that's always an interesting topic that some people are like obsessed with the gap. That's like half, <laughs> like one and a half the width of the disc. And some people just think that's ridiculous myself included. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one because, you know, there's a lot of courses these days. I mean, I remember when we played the uh, Beaver State Fling layout and we got to a hole that was 392 feet and they're like, this is the shortest hole you're going to play all day. And I was like, wow, things are <laughs> things have changed in the past uh, decade or so. Um, all right. Well, we're going to move on to the next one uh, on to our next topic here. So this is a topic that actually um, I kind of thought of. We've debated it a little bit on Griplock before Hunter and I have at least, and um, we kind of mentioned it because the Disc Golf World Tour, which was a an old Disc Golf Tour entity, updated their Facebook profile picture, which means absolutely nothing. But Turns we started. Turns out they got hacked. I, I found the, so, the root of it. So, well, luckily this question has nothing to do with that specifically. Um, but in any case, it kind of sparked the conversation again of like what were to happen if a competing tour existed. So the topic here is many popular sports leagues have risen to their current success only after overcoming the threat of a competing league within the sport. Examples would be the ABA and NBA, the NFL and USFL, um, et cetera. Has disc golf already gone through that? 
um, in the past you know, 30 years or so? Or would it be beneficial for the DGPT to have competition driving each tour forward and potentially ending in one united, stronger product? So would that be a good thing or could it be a disaster? Rich, what do you think? If the competing league stops trying to make us play on converted ball golf courses, then yeah, it's, I'm all for it. Let's put another league out there to compete so that we're not playing at Harvey Pennock here in Austin or stuff like that. Uh, look, I, I don't think the NBA got big because the ABA existed. I don't think the NFL got big because the USFL pushed them. They got big because the sport got to a certain point at the right time and TV blew them up and all those things came together. I think that for our sport in particular, I don't know if we have the the the, the bandwidth, the backbone from an audience perspective to support a second league. We kind of had that in a certain way. We talk about like Central Coast Disc Golf or like other productions, like minor stuff to feed the, the hardcore fan. But do we even have the fan base to support a competing league? Or is that just going to be, I think that'd be more of a cannibalization thing. I think that the, the game is moving in overall the right direction. If you take a look, I mean, again, my, my, I started, I joined the PDJ in 2007. I remember when this was just work trucks and hippies and there was nothing you could really watch. And now I get to tune in live on the weekends with live coverage and watch a ton of disc golf. We're fine. We don't need some version of live golf coming and poaching half the players to, and then making the whole league implode. And then they reform into some Voltron. We're good. <laughs> Let's just keep doing what we're doing and have fun playing disc golf and the game will continue to grow, especially when you start seeing 15 year olds winning stuff like M winning MA1 uh, national qual NAGDG qualifiers here in Austin. Those guys are growing the sport. We just need to let it grow the way it's growing and we'll all be fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, and, you know, the pro tour. Certainly, like I would never go out and say the Pro Tour is like doing an awful job, and that's why this uh, would be beneficial. I'm not even saying it would be beneficial. I'm more, more so posing the question. But um, yeah, no, it's totally fair to say, hey, just let it keep going as it is. Hunter, do you agree? Uh, yeah, no, I agree with what, what Rich said. Um, my, my stance on this hasn't changed. Uh, I'm going to just use the examples that were given to us here. The ABA was formed and challenged the NBA after the NBA had already been around for 21 seasons. The USFL started 63 years after the NFL had already started and went on to merge with the XFL, not the NFL, which for note, the XFL was started in 2001, a full 81 years after the NFL. Basically, the point I'm trying to make here is disc golf, in my opinion, just too young right now to, to go through this mainly because of the talent pool size. I know rich hit on the audience side. I'm gonna flip it onto the talent pool side here. Um, we, we kind of saw this a little, little bit with the whole NT DGPT, you know, back and forth a little bit back in the day. And we saw some issues with it, right? The DGPT was trying to bring the media stuff in house. They said, no, Jomez. And what did that lead to that led to players like Nate Sexton saying the no DGPT for me, when you stuff like that happens in a different sport, you know, you can have Brooks Kepka step off tour and you can be okay. You can't have but so many players step off the disc golf pro tour and be okay. Like if live golf were to pop up right now and poach 20 of our top 40 guys, then both products would simply just be mediocre compared to what we have now. And our sport would suffer, not thrive because of that. Could it be good in the future? Sure. But disc golf, I think, has to farther establish itself so that if competition arises, the overall products of the tour don't just get wrecked because we don't have enough talent to sustain it, which is, I think, where we're at right now. Okay. All right. Hunter, uh, also in agreement that it would be more of a cannibalization than uh, a, a growth catalyst. Um, Cade, what do you think? Yeah, I think right now disc golf and the professional scene is definitely too young to even have another two or even thinking about stepping up right now. I think when you look at the future, I think that you know, even in 10 years, if someone's going to come up or an organization is going to start another tour they they have to know they're not making money right away. And that's a hard sell to even come up with another tour because it's pretty much just for the love of the game at that point, hoping one day, maybe you make your money back. And then I think also it could be good in the future because it's going to keep you honest. It's going to keep the DGPT and whoever's the competitor honest, but right now, definitely not. We're too young. And then when you kind of look back at like the national tour disc golf pro tour, um, I really don't even think you can compare that because it was a very short lived, you know, competition. The national tour ended up going away. Um, but yeah, like, like Hunter was saying how you had Nate Sexton, you know, basically saying, I'm not going to play disc golf pro tour because Joe Mez is not going to film, you know, that's, that's not something you want the players doing. And then also kind of backing up on Hunter's some of Hunter's points, but yeah, we've got a hundred, 120, you know, tour players right now. And if you cut that in half, it's just, it's a bad product. And disc golf's definitely not ready for that right now. 
Okay, so Kate also in agreeance would not be a good move right now. All right, Brody Smith, known live golf fan. What do so, you think? Yeah, right. Um, so <laughs> a few things. You guys, Hunter and Cade, both were talking about, like, if you cut the field in half, it's going to be a bad product. Like, how long ago do you have to go to where that was what disc golf was? Like, think about it. Like, these last couple of years, top players haven't just retired. All the top players are the top players that were 10 years ago. They're all still playing right now at a high level. And we have how many new guys showing up? So, like, 10 years ago, was that what the disc golf product was? Probably, right? Like, I don't think we had 40 top yeah. guys last year or 10 years ago. So something interesting to think about. The other thing, I, I'll say this quickly. Competition is always a good thing. You want to have some competition. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need another tour for the Disc Golf Pro Tour to have competition. They have competition. They are competing with every other sport right now to get eyeballs. They are competing with a pickleball. They are competing with golf. They are competing with all these other sports of trying to get people's attention that play disc golf, but also play other sports. No, watch us, not them. Uh, the last thing I'm going to use the last 20 seconds here. I don't know what Rich was just doing with that ricochet shot on golf courses. That was wild. I don't know <laughs> where, I don't know where that came from and the hatred of golf courses. But to me, that sounds like a debate that I would love to have with Rich is why he thinks golf courses are bad for uh, disc golf. Yeah. Everybody, no, everybody loves talking about that. We've, we, <laughs> What do you have, Hunter? This came out. Of nowhere. I just wanted to, to. Brody was asking the point of a few years ago, like how far back do you have to go for that not to be true? And he's right. You don't have to go far back. But basically, the product you run into is the Ricky and Paul era, right? Yeah. Which was a very fun era to watch disc golf in. But what you had was like Paul could have a somewhat off weekend and still win. Ricky mm -hmm. could have a somewhat off weekend and still win. That's not true anymore. And if you want to see a taste of that era, it's what FPO is going through right now. Right, where you have Chris and Tatar, and if she's on and dominating, then she's gonna there's gonna be some rounds where she goes in the final round and it's just like it's not a lot to watch. The the book's done, it's just like who's coming in second. Or there might be one or two players up there, but that's not nearly as fun as you go in and you have 20 players that can legitimately win stepping onto the field every and we're just now getting there. If you split it, it just sets the sport back to the Smashbox era a few years ago, you know, 10 years ago when yeah, you, you hope that the two guys who play good just, you know, maybe don't play so good that it's just one guy out at the top, which is, I think, now, where we were. Just to add on to that, too, I think there are some guys, you know, we saw it last year with a few guys of where they didn't have to play perfect to win. But I think what Hunter's saying is, like, if you go back a couple of years, you can watch some of these guys win these tournaments and be like, they did not play well. Like, you're watching bad shots and they're still winning where now that's very, very hard to do. People that win still are playing pretty well. Not yeah. perfect, yeah, it was like but a, pretty well. You, True. you could play, like Paul would have tournaments, like 2015 Worlds, for instance, obviously was like freaking nine rounds or something, but he was way out of it and then just shot a course record or maybe back-to-back -back course records and then just had a victory lap because yeah. like that's not happening in today's game. Like Paul does the same thing at Champions Cup, slips up, shoots a 16 under, that's good enough a few years ago that he's winning. It's, it's done. It's the written tournament. in the book. But now you have so many players that have risen to that level where they can play at that, that you can't slip up. You can't have mm. a truly bad round anymore and still win tournaments. That was the case if you go back, you know, less than 10 years ago. Yeah. Do we have more or less uh, chase card wins in this era than there used to be? I never really thought, never oh, done the, the math on that. Ask me more. You would, so you, you would... You, I, you would think you it could go either Jonas way, though. Right? It could go either way anyone. because you have you have more depth now. But because if if the better players like the Paul and Ricks were on the later cards, they were going to win like all the time. So it almost evens out, but for different reasons. But who knows? Were there yeah, chase I, card wins though? Like I feel like they had to implement. I feel like they had to implement like for a showing while, that for a while. Paul if Paul and Rick were on. Like I feel like when they were back, although I guess the problem is because there was a lack of depth too. Like your top four were still were so card. far. Yeah, they were yeah. so <laughs> far ahead of everybody. I remember. So I, I think Paul won European Open from Chase Card. If I'm if I remember yeah, correct, I think he I think came he from like eight strokes back or something. But like you watched Jomez was like the only way to consume it really uh, back then, and like. You just you pretty much it. always it saw wasn't the winner. Even, it wasn't in your head that someone else could win this event. Like yeah, that wasn't yeah. even a thing. Like that just wasn't really. I feel like your the mind. first time that happened, and they like flashed it up on the screen, like, and look at this score that came in from the actual eventual <laughs> winner. We were like, "What? Like, what do you mean? I just yeah. watched a half an hour of this, 
anyways um yeah uh certainly it's gonna be something interesting to watch in the future because i yeah i would i would agree that an opposing tour jumping in now would certainly complicate things a whole lot and it would be very uh very troubling for the pro tour scene as Unless a whole it was european it's true the european star horse um all right we're gonna move on to uh, some current events here so we've had our first event of the season now we love to make knee-jerk reactions in sports especially at the start of a new season we get we finally have data to look at there's a leaderboard in front of us and the takes just start flying out because we have an idea of what people look like um so my question here is after the first event of the season which player jumped onto your radar that wasn't there before um, and how long into the season before you start to consider up and comers as legitimate staples on tour and not just a flash in the pan? Hunter, what do you think? This was kind of a tough question because if you look at chess.com, like the the top players, I mean, if you look at the top 10, basically they're all well established names that if they weren't really on your radar, you might want to get your radar checked out because something's going off there. Um, so to me, looking at the top 10, the obvious answer that stuck out was Jesse Niemannen. Um, the only other one I was thinking about was Joseph Anderson. But if you look at him last year, KC wide open, he came in second, fifth at Mid-America, top 30 at Worlds, top 20 at MVP, top 20 at USDGC to end it out. So like, I mean, there's a reason he kind of was on my radar. Jesse Niemannen, on the other hand, he hasn't toured in the US that I could find before this year, but he has a full touring schedule lined up ahead of him he kicked it off with a top 10 here at chess.com which is obviously a phenomenal way to start your season um and he's qualified for uscgc the last two years he came in top 50 last year as well as top 30 at worlds where i had heard his name from and probably a lot of people have heard his name from was back in 2022 he came in sixth place at the european open that was kind of his best finish i saw outside of kind of european tours so i think it'll be very interesting to see what uh what he's able to do on tour here but it is going to take you know i think if he sprinkles four or five top tens in throughout the season then that kind of becomes a a more legitimate staple but you got to do it for multiple seasons till you're like a staple staple on tour because we've had guys burst onto the scene have a really good season and then disappear yeah okay so hunter's hunter's looking for the long game he wants to see a a consistent product that makes sense that makes sense um kate how about you yeah, so I'm going to go with someone that, you know, definitely has been on my radar in the past, but last year was not, I mean, he kind of fell off my radar, to be honest with you, and that's Gavin Rathbun. I think Gavin, mm. he's a guy that, you know, last year going through injuries, I even looked up at some of his stats last year, and he beat two people at USDGC, and both of them DNF'd. So <laughs> people that finished the tournament, he got dead last, um, going unsponsored into this year, um, you know, he even debated and even talked about not even touring this year. And so I think that's a guy that moving forward, you know, in the past, he was talked about having all the skills in the world. He could, you know, potentially be one of the best in the game. And I think that, you know, it's great to see someone like him, you know, bounce back from the injury after that. And then, you know, I think he got sixth place um, at chess.com. So I think that's someone moving forward. That's definitely back on my radar. And then transitioning to the second part of the question, how long until, like an up and comer, which isn't necessarily Gavin, but we see some other guys like that become legitimate staples. And I think that if you can maintain like cash throughout the DGPT season and not to say you have to cash at every single event, but if you're cashing at 80%, I think that through that season, you're a staple on tour. And if you can either even string together like multiple top tens throughout a season, I think that definitely um, deserves to be considered a staple on tour for that season. And like Hunter said, I think to be, you know, someone that's talked about all the time, you've got to do it for multiple seasons. Yeah, no, that's a really good pool, Rathbun. I um, talk about, like, you're not kidding. A, a guy a few years ago who was, like, seriously being talked about as, like, the next big thing. Like, he was, he had a ton of hype and then just, yeah, fell off the face of the planet, it seemed like. And um, it was weird. Like, when I saw his name on the leaderboard, I, I assumed it was Gavin Babcock, another up-and-comer. And I, uh, and I was like, oh, wait a second, Gavin Rathbun. How about that? So that he will be a very interesting one to watch this season and uh, see if he's kind of had a chip on his shoulder and can get things going again. Um, all right, Brody, who's on your radar? Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear that Cade and Trevor, both of you guys are fan of the show. Uh, we had this question, I think, last week or something very similar, and my answer was Gavin Rathbun. So that is awesome that you guys listened and agreed with me that he was the surprise of the uh, tournament. So I agree with both of you. Um, as far as how long, I think, I think if they perform well, like in 10 events throughout the season, I think then you can start looking at them as potentially being like a solid player 
the main thing though is like courses are so different and some players we see that they're very course specific there are some people isaac robinson ricky calvin there's a there's a handful of guys put them on any course they're gonna do well but then there's some specialists that we know like oh it's a big course they're probably going to perform well here or oh it's a short technical like if it's a short technical course or a wooded course i'm putting more stock in a chris dickerson high finish versus chris dickerson playing out at you know glendevere and portland open so there is some of that to be said too of where we might just see some guys perform well because of the course but i think if you do decent job throughout the season 10 events you have good finishes i think then that's when you can kind of start looking at this person as a potential uh player to look at and keep track of yeah fair enough man if only there was somebody who hosted the show last week that also read this week's questions man that would that could have saved me some trouble um anyways <laughs> thanks a lot hunter um rich round it out for us apparently repeating history here i mean you know, it was a diff it was somewhat of a different question it must have been because i know hunter would have called me out if he thought it was a direct repeat i mean i just wrote the question i didn't plan out answers until this week <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have an answer last week i was i'm excited Okay. He, he just wanted to answer the question himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a good question. I wanted to answer it. He All thought right. it was so good. He wanted to ask it twice. He's like, oh, sick. Now I get a chance at it. <laughs> a whole extra week of prep on the question, too. My yeah. word. Just stacking the deck in your own favor. Unreal. Well, uh, yeah, okay. So that's the first part of your question. Uh, there's this 23 year old kid out of Arizona who really impressed me this weekend, got his first tour win. So I think that Anthony Barella should consider playing this professionally for the rest of his career. That would be a, a good choice on his part. Um, I don't know. I, I, hate, I, I hate this question this year. It's this, this time of year because it's the first event, right? Let's talk about first events, right? Last year, uh, we had a player who got seventh place in, at Las Vegas Open, looked great, and that's Zach Arlinghouse. And then Zach Arlinghouse went on to the rest of the season and averaged 44th place for the rest of the season. I have my fantasy disc golf game with my buddy, Bob, and whoever wins each event has to buy the other person a disc from the event. That Ooh. Zach Arlinghouse cost me probably a hundred dollars a disc <laughs> that I had to buy for Bob. I kept on picking him because I kept on thinking he'd outperform his ranking and it, 44th place. Young guy, obviously, but that he, he looked so good in Vegas. Now let's go to the other side of that, right? And that's uh, a guy who got 46th place in Vegas, and then went on to average 19th, multiple podiums, won an event, and that's Cole Redolin. That's the kind of year you want to see. And Cole didn't have an amazing 2022. He had a fine 2022, and then he had an elite 2023. So you can't really look at that. You don't know what happens to someone over the course of a season. Taking a look at this first week and going, oh, this person blew up. This person showed out. No one was going to be picking Cole to be a top 10 guy wow. in terms of last wow. season. Maybe wow. Big hunt. <laughs> Big hunt. You know, Big well, hunt. well played, Hunter. So, but like <laughs> Cole's 2022 season didn't justify saying he's a top 10 guy in 2023. And then he turned into an absolute elite player in that season. He's also and super Zach young. House, and he's super young. Zach Arlenhouse also young and lots of room to grow, but didn't pay the promise of the premise hey, from Las Vegas. Let's listen, not do that yet. It's a knee jerk reaction, Rich. That's, yeah. you know, that's listen, this is foundation podcast. I, we I asked the same questions the, twice in a row. I, I even predicted the month Cole was going to run rich. Yeah, oh, but is it's true. a massive difference between looking at like a seven lucky. year vet and thinking the seven year vet's going to all of a sudden figure it out in his eighth year. And a guy that like can, can't, can't even, uh, I don't know. Tell that to Paul Ulibarri, bro. Last season, he he got shot out he of a cannon injured. last year. He was injured. <laughs> well, that's different. He's also yeah. he was injured. But like that's what I'm saying. Like you can see massive growth in some of these guys. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Gannon just popped out of nowhere at this tournament we're playing this week, um, and now he's you know a top five player. So no, it's true. And and you know I feel like um, Waco, especially coming up, is like the one we always talk about as like the most unpredictable not be tournament anymore. It's not going to be fluky anymore, we'll see. boys. It will we'll see. I don't know, man. Waco's wacko. Waco's it wacko. Will, you know what's not, funny about that? Not is like, like two rounds at Lake Waco. <laughs> the winners it's, of Waco are not that crazy. Like you had like Big Germ won back to back yeah. and Paul won back to back. Like it's not that have, crazy. Like, we just love saying there, it though. <laughs> Colt Montgomery snuck in there. Big Germ There's a couple won weird two ones. in playoffs. Nate, Nate Perkins almost won Nate twice Perkins there. To be fair, Big Germ winning back to back is kind of weird. Conrad was in a playoff when he wasn't popping off yet. Like Waco's always been wacko. I will say this is not the year to Luke bet Humphreys on the second at one point this is not the year to bet on like some dark horse person 
I will say that Lake okay. Waco is it will it will separate the, the, the boys other. from the men. Unfortunately, I've got a six hundred dollar parlay on one <laughs> Evan Scott. <laughs> Evan, Evan Scott could be a good pick here. Yeah, dude. Good Evan good Scott, here. he's the best of the Evans. There's two of them. Um, all right. Final topic for our um for our finals here. Uh we got Waco coming up here. So the upcoming Waco annual charity open uh uh, begins what fans are calling the Texas swing of the tour with three straight events in the Lone Star State. Many have fixated on the geography of tour stops, complaining about their uneven distribution or lack of representation in certain regions. With most disc golfers tuning in online to watch, is it actually that important where the pros play so long as the courses are solid? Are people too fixated on that as a potential issue? Cade, what do you think? Um, you know, I think that when you look at the geography of the disc golf pro tour and where tour events are, Earlier today, I hopped on and looked at the schedule, and west of Kansas, there's three events, Elite Series or Major. East of Kansas and east, there's 17. So, you know, I like to think Kansas is right in the middle of the United States. When you look at the geography, there's, you know, three events even west of Kansas. And I think that's something that there, it shouldn't be even because, obviously, the disc golf history, there's more courses, there's a lot more people on the eastern half of the United States, but at least give the west side like six I don't know, something like that, because right now you have a bunch of players skipping out on the west side of the tour because there's three events out there. They can miss three events. They'll play the other 17. They'll be fine. But if you had six or seven events out there, no one's skipping that entire six or seven event stretch. That's a staple on tour. So in my opinion, um, the geography does matter because you're you're not drawing fans out there. You're not growing the sport in the west western half of the United States. Um, because like I live in Emporia, we have the dynamic discs open and you wouldn't believe how many new players each year, um, come up because the dynamic discs open comes to Emporia and they hear about it. They come out and watch around and they're like, wow, this is awesome. And then to go back into the three events in Texas, um, my only thing there is you don't want to draw from the sp same spectator pool more than once. And with how far away those cities are, I'm not sure if you are, but that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so Kate, hey, no, there's nothing to do in Emporia, brother. Um, tell Play that to golf. Jeremy Rusco Topia yeah. coming in 2030. Well, no, 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 no. This idea that this idea that a tournament coming to a, uh, uh, Atlanta is all of a sudden going to get Billy Joe out of his house to go watch a disc golf pro tour is crazy. Um, I don't. I I actually don't know why the geography matters at all. I think what you said at the end is like if the courses are good. Is that the only thing that matters? Yes. Now, obviously, should we have an entire tour in Charlotte, North Carolina? Probably not. But at the end of the day, if we can get, like, if, if we could have 10 events in Charlotte, North Carolina, and all the courses are good, and we get a crazy amount of people to show up, why, why would you not do that? Why would you not just go and do Boston, Massachusetts, Maple Hill, Go 10 events there. Go to, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Emporia. That A lot of people show up to that one if there is an amateur tournament at the same time. Um, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? I think that's, I, I don't know why the geography really actually does matter all that much. I think it really just comes down to if people are going to show up to the tournament, that matters. And is the course good? Is it look good on coverage? Do the play, like, is it a good score separating course? I, I actually wish that I went last here because I don't really have that much to say. <laughs> and I was really he just hoping know. To, I was really just a rebuttaling a lot of people because I honestly don't have like Kate did not it's sway me. Kate did not sway me that we should have more events out west of Kansas. Listen, there's, it's, a, there's a reason that not that many people live out there. It's an interesting question. That's why that's why I want to know what people think. Rich, what do you think? Do you think geography doesn't matter? I think geography matters tremendously, and for one very important reason. Please direct your attention you to no, this whoa. map, oh, no. this map oh, no. right here. Oh, this, no. this is a map that shows the distribution <laughs> of people in the U.S. and where the heck they actually are. And I want you to is notice this, something. There's people here, and there's people here. Guess where there's no people? I'm going to show you right now. Right where I am, there's nobody here. <laughs> There's nobody there. Go where the food is. That's what Sam Kinison said. So why would you go to any of this? Go to Denver, maybe. There's some cool courses there. But look, you take me away. The map's not different because there's nothing here at all. Now, let's do one more thing. Let's add in where the Pro Tour is going oh. this year. Right? I'll, I have to shift a little bit to get Texas in there. Right? There's the Texas swing. But the Pro Tour goes coincidentally 
where the people are. And that's where you got to go. Go where people show up. Now, Brody wants to turn the Disc Golf Pro Tour into the Disc Golf Residency, I guess, where it's just where, like Britney Spears <laughs> playing rounds in the same place over and over again. I think you got to go to different places and show off the beauty that is the country and that is the world. And, you know, I think it's cool to go over here somewhere. Um, we can't really go down here because houses like a three bedroom house cost 800 grand down here so like trying to produce More down there is insane <laughs> that none of the players could afford an airbnb in this no. area right so let's let's avoid all this but and and, and in, the, in the end go where the people are and make it a tour and you've got a great product okay yeah. I mean, that's a great graph that was thank you very much that was <laughs> incredible that was like the best graph i've ever seen for yeah this that ball. was wow i'll tell you what the the uh the bar has been raised around yeah, just here send them to the finals already <laughs> green screens <laughs> um okay hunter now you can show yours yeah, I was going to say, y'all's minds are about to be blown. This is all fake. Let's pull it down. No, that's my real background. Um, no, I think everyone's been saying basically the same thing without saying it. I think that the the key here as to like where and why they're doing this Texas swing, why they're choosing what they choose, is the atmosphere. The atmosphere of tournament that's going on. I think having players feel the energy of the crowd makes for a much better product, even for us at home. So if I'm watching from home, Brody made a great point. If you can have 10 events in Charlotte and they're all super well attended – that's going to be great. But you know what's even a better point is to have one event in Charlotte that all the people that would win to all 10 come to that one instead of it being sparsely spread out, which is why Rich's map is important, right? Where you go to different places, so you're only hitting places once and you have all Future of them rebuttal. together instead of it all being spread out. So having three events in Texas isn't a big deal as long as they're all well attended. Staying close to major cities, great strategy for the Pro Tour, in my opinion, as it increases population and therefore increases the chances that you're going to have a lot of people at these events. Uh, I think this is a big reason why we see a black hole in the you know western part of the U.S. as Rich stole my thunder with an actual map. But if you look at the population density map, the tour makes a whole lot of sense when you do that. Um, and if an event has a good tour course and a great crowd, in my opinion, that's a better stop than a great tour course with no crowd. The crowd brings energy that you can feel even if you're sitting at home on the couch because it increases players' reactions. It increases the audio experience. It increases everything. So I think that's why the tour makes the decisions it does right now. All right, Brody, how about it? My only future rebuttal to that is just obviously the 10 events in one place is a, is a crazy thing to think about. But if Charlotte has the biggest disc golf fan base and it's massive, then you can't have multiple events there. You don't need to just have one event and then deuce out and go to. Now, the only reason I say this is if we're leaving Charlotte to go to other places that no one cares about, that no one shows up to, let's just do multiple events in Charlotte. Let's do multiple events in areas that we know people are going to they show do have up. multiple events in Charlotte. I was going to gonna say, fair. here's, yeah. here's yeah. your exact uh, th example. That's what all is, I'm saying is I don't think we should go to places just because we've already been to other places. That's, well, I think the problem is if you look at USDGC and then the next weekend being the tour championship, that's too close. you see, Yes. You see one being very heavily attended and the yeah. other looking semi ghost town. But also the course, the courses are vastly different. One course pulling is from great. The same and audience one, is the problem. Like if I'm one course is away, great and one course is not good hunter. The audience, the general disc golf public would completely disagree with you. They would say that Nevin is the better of the two yeah. courses. He's got a point. To watch, I, to watch or to play. I don't, those I'm are just, two different things. You can head to Reddit, man. I don't know. I live three hours I, I away. Would, I would I'm argue only the viewers would say one otherwise. Of those two courses. I'm only driving to one of those two <laughs> tours for events. So if there's seven events in Charlotte, I'm now picking you have one. To make me and look up them. and do research. You piece of crap. I will say, like, uh, um, no, the point if like if they had, um, let's just say if USDGC was in April for an example and Tour Championship was in October, it would do well. Like you could overlap those same areas if you hit them at different times of the year. It's the fact they try to hit them so close. And obviously at the end of the day, Texas is huge. Like the reason why they're able to hit Texas three times, it is, there's a lot of disc golfers like down it. there, but it's a massive Plus, state. The, the only problem like is they, they are choosing, sports teams. they're choosing True. like three places that are within, correct me if I'm wrong, like a three hour radius of each other. No one's I'm going to choose from you, Austin and vice versa, though. Yes, if you That's live in Dallas, if you live in Dallas, you're coming down to Waco. If you live in Dallas, you're probably not going to Austin. If you live in Houston, or if you, no one's going to Houston. The only people that are going to Houston are Houston people. Houstonite. But I'm saying, how will. big would <laughs> how big would the open at Austin be if it was the only option for the people who live? It's like everybody Dallas. aren't driving it's down from it. Dallas to Austin, Hunter. Not, you're not driving three hours. No, well, he doesn't even want to do it. He lives who, in Dallas. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. 
East I mean, Coast what are you talking different. about? Yeah, I say on the East Coast, like I smell a Pro Tour in five of five hours. I'm showing. Yeah, up. you also yeah. own a disc golf company. What are we talking about here? I went we're to talking USCGC. about I went to USCGC. We're talking about these Cade people that I ever opened. No, we're talking about <laughs> we're, we're talking about Cade's people that it's like a, a Pro Tour comes and all of a sudden it's like the circus and everyone's like, oh my gosh, I gotta go to this thing. That's who we're talking Emporia about. And is the disc golf capital of the world. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you, that should tell you something. And you just wait until Emporia. you just wait until right. Roscotopia opens. I'm looking up. I'm looking up this thing because I I know I'm probably not going to go in the finals, but I do. No, just you're definitely say, not. <laughs> um, so, am I looking this up right? Round one MPO Tour Championship, fifty three thousand views. That that doesn't seem like a whole lot. I don't. What's the point? I don't know. What are we? What, I, what's, I was what's just saying for? round round one round. Hunter was trying to say that people think the course at Nevin is better. Round one MPO Tour Championship, fifty three thousand. No, people views. don't care about the event. Round one USDGC, one hundred and twelve. That doesn't have anything to do More with the course, though. P- it's wait, the wh- event. I don't understand. Wait, what was your argument? I don't even remember. I was just saying, if you ask, if you ask a hundred people, is Winthrop Gold or Nevin a better course? Probably eighty of them would say Nevin. That wasn't the question. The question Pensy is, pole. what, which, which would you rather watch a tournament at? That's the question. You just said you you said one's a better course than the other, and I said that wouldn't be the answer you got. Yes, a better course for an event for a tournament. That's what we're talking about. We're talking I about this Pro Tours event. I love Winthrop. What I've are we been, I go about Winthrop here? every year. You Winthrop's hate my it. favorite course. I like it too. I'm just All saying right. it got double the views. It got double the views. So clearly, people like to watch that event Listen, more guys. than the Disc Golf Pro Tour by double. Everybody, relax. Don't make me mute you. All right, I, we're going I, on to the finals. Rich and Hunter. Rich with a commanding three-point lead after the most remarkable display of green screening that's ever been witnessed on the show. And actually, the only um, example of green screening. Can you pull witnessed. that up real quick and show me where Emporia, Kansas is again? Uh, it's kind of close, it. close to Kansas City. <laughs> it's, it's, it's somewhere where you fly over it. That's the whole oh, why God, they call Kate, it a fly Kate, over it. Are you going to take this? Hey, get it out. Come on, man. You Come take on, that? Kate. Come horns. All right. It's a flyover state. You know, I don't know who sang the song, but it's in a song. But at the end of the day, you're, you got Wichita an hour south, Kansas City an hour northeast. So it's, it's not right, in the middle It's of right in between. It's, it's in there. Those are some points. Those are some points. Hey, okay, Kansas City twice sick. if you're if you don't have the uh, tourism department of Emporia on <laughs> on you right now. <laughs> Blink twice. <if> you... <laughs> That's so. Funny. You, just, you just see somebody walk behind him with like a, a visit Emporia <laughs> sign. <laughs> He's like, that's what I do for the campus. I, I work for the tourism. He's, oh, he's trying to get recruits right now. I will say Emporia is awesome. I actually love it a lot. So I if you go. are a disc golf, if you're a disc golf fan, it is an awesome, awesome place to visit. Especially I'd like to go. I think they're bringing back the Swedish bonfire this year, right? The you heck that is right? that? <laughs> yeah, what is that? The, like Wait, downtown, what? the like GBO bonfire thing that you used to always do. Yeah, we'll have the block party back again. So oh, nice. let's go. See? All yeah, right. Go. Hunter's going to be there. He's setting the bonfire this year. He's lighting it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd be on the on to the final topic here. Right. Um, two minutes per. Rich, would you like to go first or second? I'll take number two on this one. Okay, he's going to take a number two. Um, all right, we're going to talk ratings. The Memorial brought ratings talk back to the surface due to Anthony Barella's 17 under that was rated at 11.13. Is the ever-present ratings obsession driven more by the players, the PDGA, or something else entirely? Who stands to benefit from it staying relevant? And will disc golf ever be free of any such system? Whole lot to unpack here, Hunter. What do you think? First off, I called this at the beginning. Uh, esports commentators are my kryptonite, and I knew exactly where I would be at the end of this, and I also know what's about to happen to me. So I am just here for the ride. Uh, I think to answer your question here that it is most driven actually by the fans. Um, and here's my reasoning why. I think it's the only metric that you can compare yourself to pros without playing the same courses. It's also the only metric that we use to compare ourselves to each other whether you're playing without playing the same tournaments or maybe even living in the same area as other people. And the weight that AMS put on the rating system now spills over um, into the perception of this stat. And also a lot of those AMS are the ones turning into pros and you've been conditioned your whole time, sometimes even to get 10, 15 to be sponsored by someone. And then all of a sudden you're not supposed to care about it anymore. 
Um, the PBJ obviously stands to gain the most here, in my opinion, by it staying relevant because they're the ones that it's the, one of the biggest factors in people's PDJ memberships. And I don't think disc golf will ever really be free of it. And I don't think they ever should really be free of it, in my opinion, because uh, I think the Pro Tour should separate itself from the PDJ and the PDJ should be for AMs and local events, which would then allow the pro scene to be free of the ratings and all the you know stuff around the ratings, because like I said, the ratings, I think, is something that's used to compare when you can't be playing the same courses at the same places, which the Pro Tour you are. So it doesn't matter what the rating is because on the Pro Tour, which obviously Memorial's not, but on the Pro Tour, you're playing with the same people week in, week out. You're playing the same courses. Um, I'd also like to see the rating system be adjusted going forward. But but similar to how the, the handicap system exists in golf, I think if you just kind of view it that way, where it's more on the am side it's more for your casual players to be able to compare when you show up to a course as to how you're going to compare toe to toe with someone and use it that way but i think that's kind of why it's been spilled over we just need to get the pros once you're on the tour ratings go out the window problem solved okay yeah i mean it's a it's a tale as old as time the foundation the classic foundation ratings take um but i think it's pretty sound rich what do you think well first i think that uh hunter knew he'd be here in these finals because he came prepared for that final question hit pretty much every point. I feel like Eminem at the end of eight mile where you just said all the things I would have say about me. Uh, look, the ratings are great for two reasons. One, because we, that's how you designate disc golfers throughout every stage of their career, right? You don't go like, Hey, are you a uh, MA two? How many putts did you make from 20 feet in a row? Or how far can you throw it? You go, what's your rating? It's a simple way of helping you navigate through your disc golf life if you want to be a competitor. And otherwise, we're just going, we're going like, I don't know, you won that and you made a good putt. So I guess you're in this division now or whatever. And those divisions for the majority of the disc golf community, especially those who are just coming in, those divisions are really important. So we get a clear way to deal with that. And again, you don't just go through that system and then be like, well, I'm a pro now. It's gone. The second part of it is it's a stat that we get to talk about. We get to have this conversation. We get to go, oh my gosh, someone broke the the, the, the greatest. We're going to have a 1,200 rated round. This is insane. No one's ever done it before. Hoopla, dogs and cats living together, pure anarchy. That's the stuff that we want. Nobody in disc golf is talking about greens and regulation. Nobody in disc golf is talking about a whole bunch of other, like they might talk about putting percentage or C1 or whatever it might be or C2 percentage. But this is really one of those stats that we get to talk about and get to look at and get to have fun with. And the whole point of this is that we get to have fun with it, right? That's why you go out and throw plastic. That's why you watch others throw plastic. And that's why we talk about people throwing plastic is because it's fun. And this is one more thing that makes it fun. And as Hunter said, makes it relatable through every single stage of your disc golf career. And that's the whole point is that this whole thing is supposed to be relatable for all of us. Yeah, I, I think that I think that is the kicker there is that it is relatable. Um, I think that, you know, the rating system, you know, you guys both kind of said it doesn't really make sense for the pros, but also it probably doesn't really matter to them that much. Um, I do also agree, you know, as long as the PDGA has the reins on it, you know, we all know that they're probably never giving that up. And as much as Hunter and I want them to someday, the pro tour to sail off into the distance, it'll probably, it'll probably be a long time before that happens if it does. But, uh, Rich, Rich, you're our winner today. What a performance rookie, your rookie, uh, showcase there getting the win. Any, any, uh, any words of advice to the next rookies that'll join the show? Get Photoshop. That's a, a pretty good start there. <laughs> Because apparently that's a big leg up. I, I tell you, you throw in a prop, and I'm not just, listen, it has to be tasteful, but if you throw a prop into this thing, I don't even know what to do with myself. Who was it? What happened the last time? Oh, it was a Lucas spreadsheet. Had a spreadsheet. Like, I mean, that stuff just gets me worked up. I'll tell you, when, whenever you have a prop to help your argument, it, it doesn't hurt. doesn't hurt. But you know what? If you use it every time, it might get old. So don't use it every time. Listen, I'm not easy to deal with. <laughs> There's, I, I got a lot of nuance the way I hand out these points, but uh, great show there. Thanks to everybody for watching this episode of Debate Night. Hopefully you enjoyed listening. Um, we're going to throw a QR code up on the screen now. Uh, you can see on your screen that you can scan and you can submit topics that you want to see us debate on the show. Um, you can go ahead. It'll link you to a Google form. There's also a link in the description if you're using your phone right now and you're like, how the heck do I scan this QR code? Um, so make sure to check that out. And we will be back next week with yet another episode.